Welcome to the ninth annual Toner Prize Celebration. Welcome everyone. Now, I'm Lakshmi Singh, an anchor with NPR News here in Washington. And I've been given the honor of emceeing this event for you. Now, I just wanted to do a quick rundown of what can, we can expect uh, in the night ahead, and then I'll let you get to your awesome dinners. I won't hold you back. Um, this event, program, and prize, as you all know, they honor the life and work of Robin Toner, the first woman to serve as national political correspondent for the New York Times, and, of course, had a significant hand, as the New York Times wrote, in the coverage of a broad spectrum of historically pivotal political moments, including five presidential elections. Now tonight, and year round, we honor Robin's legacy by shining a light on the work of political reporters across all media platforms, across this country, around the globe, who have consistently proven their respect for the facts and respect for their audiences. So if I may, could we have a round of applause for all of these political reporters who do this day in and day out. Thank you, thank you for what you do. Tonight, we'll take a moment to recognize one of Robin's New York Times colleagues and Toner Program supporter, Adam Clymer, who died last fall. And we will hear from university officials and our keynote speaker, uh, Maryland's Republican governor, Larry Hogan. He's here this evening. Yes, please. It's wonderful that he's taking the time to speak with us. And we'll recognize and reward some of the best political coverage of the past year. So with that to look forward to and much more, let me leave you to enjoy your dinners and of course each other's company and invigorating conversations. And I'll be back in about half an hour to get the celebrations rolling. All right, we'll be back. Enjoy your dinners, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Clink, clink. It's good. <laughs> I hope everyone's enjoying. Dinner's just coming in, the main entree. So um, just continue enjoying while he's, you know, speaking. Introduce a few folks, please. Um, again, welcome to everyone. Those who are just joining us, welcome. And thank you so much for being here. This is an an extremely important evening. You all know, um, we all have a vested interest in this celebration. Tonight's awards recipients are part of a proud tradition in journalism of not getting captured by the loudest voice, but looking behind it for the fallout for institutions and individuals, for the cronyism and self-dealing it masks for plain and simple facts. It's the kind of journalism that's practiced by some of the toner program's most important backers. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Bloomberg, the Wall Street Journal, Politico, Stat, PBS, NPR. It's the kind encouraged by the program's institutional contributors, organizations such as the Knight Foundation, Amazon, Google, Goldman Sachs, Leverage, and the Walton Foundation, Walton Family Foundation. It's the kind that has long been supported by the Newhouse family, of course, and fostered at the Newhouse School of Public Communications by, among others, acting dean Amy Faulkner. Before arriving at Newhouse, Amy Faulkner spent a decade. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, can I do a reset? <laughs> okay, I'd like to reset. And then maybe this could be edited. It's not going to be edited just because this is just too good. <laughs> uh, 
All right. We're celebrating the ninth annual Toner Prize celebration, okay? <laughs> the Toner Program was started nearly a decade ago to help keep alive the flame of fact-based political journalism in the face of an upheaval that has forced some organizations to shrink their ambitions and others to shutter their doors. But in the years since, another far greater threat to fact-based coverage emerged in all of this, partly born of the very technology that was supposed to connect us all, and that was the internet. Having been part of the telecommunications revolution, John Chapel and his Hawkeye investments could understand better than most what was happening. John was a friend of Robbins from college. After her death, he generously underwrote the launch of the Toner program and has supported it ever since. He's with us tonight. Thank you, John. So before we were so appropriately interrupted, thank you, Peter. We are supposed to begin tonight by recognizing another early and generous supporter of the program, Adam Clymer. And here to speak about Adam is David Keene. Thank you. Just wanted to say a couple of things first. By today's standards, you all know, they made sort of an odd couple. <laughs> Sort of, right? Clymer, the political editor of what's now regularly charred as the left liberal New York Times, and Keene, former chairman of the American Conservative Union and past president of the National Rifle Association. So, of course, naturally, they became the best of fishing buddies. So, please join me in welcoming Mr. Keene. Now, if any of uh, anybody in the audience today or this evening is doing a story in which would be negative on me, I'd like you too to forget me. Uh, uh, but it, uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be with you this evening. I believe this is the first time one of these uh, affairs has been held that Adam Clymer couldn't be with you. Uh, he was a supporter of this program from the very beginning uh, and valued it a great deal. So it's an honor for me to spend a few minutes with you remembering Adam, who came during the decades as a reporter to represent the best in his profession. I arrived in Washington in an earlier era, during which political journalism was dominated by reporters like David Broder, Jack Germond, Alan Otten, Bob Shogan, Ann Compton, and yes, Adam Clymer. Adam, who was instrumental in establishing the award being given in the name of his New York Times colleague and friend Robin Toner, was a great reporter. We came at things from very different perspectives, but those of us in politics knew that he could be trusted to keep his word and report the news without allowing his personal policy preferences to affect what he wrote. His reporting was meticulous and objective. He was a pleasure to work with as a reporter and became a good after-hours friend. I first came to know Adam as a reporter during his pre-New York Times days as a political reporter with the Baltimore Sun, in an era when political operatives and reporters could be friends regardless or in some cases because of their political differences without either fearing the other, without either fearing the other would unfairly exploit that friendship. It wasn't until we discovered we shared a passion for fly fishing that we became really close friends. We traveled and we fished together for nearly 20 years. When I look back on those years, I wish there were more Adam Climbers out there, reporters who worked as reporters rather than as opinion writers pursuing ideological, political, and even partisan agendas. And I say that fully aware that my friends George W. Bush and Dick Cheney had a different view of Adam. <laughs> those, of you, those of you who knew Adam Climber well saw in him a quality that I saw often as we traveled and fished together. The man never gave up or gave in. 
He was as dogged in pursuing trout as he was in putting together a story. A colleague and mutual friend once observed that it was that very doggedness that made him such a great reporter. I must say that while I knew Robin Toner, I never really dealt with her. But I knew that like Adam, she was dedicated to her profession and to getting it right. As her own paper observed at the time of her death, she fact-checked her own stories and took pride in the fact that she wouldn't let anything that was incorrect or unsubstantiated into her work. When I read that, I know why Adam devoted so much time to helping establish the prize being awarded here today. Robin must have been like Adam in many ways. Both loved their chosen profession, were passionate about their work, and dedicated always to getting it right. With this award, their legacy lives on to encourage others to dedicate themselves to the same high standards they set. And believe me, that makes it a true honor to be allowed to participate in this evening's event. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. So, um, I've already said a little bit about <laughs> Amy Faulkner, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, listen, the acting dean is a very good friend of mine, and she's a very good friend of a lot of people in this room, and there are numerous reasons. I mean, she worked, you know, before arriving at Newhouse, she, you know, worked on both the editorial side and advertising, and I personally think that the most important title that she has held, she continues to hold, is that of a teacher. I think it's safe to say that most of us, if not all of us, have a deep appreciation for our teachers, and we carry that with us decades into the future. The roles with the simplest titles, writer, reporter, editor, teacher, they often tell you the most about a person, and teacher perfectly fits Dean Faulkner. In fact, she was the first person in the history of Newhouse to be recognized as Teacher of the Year twice, so of course that's no easy feat, especially when you're also overseeing a faculty and a curriculum that includes experimental courses in virtual and augmented reality, which I wish I had that when I went to school, I'm an alumna of Syracuse, and drone journalism, social media listening, Artificial intelligence, are you serious? Artificial intelligence and data analytics, of course, which is a big part of what many of us do in, uh, and what we need uh, in our professions today, especially. Her teaching and her efforts to look toward the future with such new initiatives as the Center for the Future of Journalism and with Sister School Maxwell as a partner, a new center for democracy, journalism, and citizenship are what will help keep Newhouse and journalism vital. And they're ones that would have won the enthusiastic support, I am sure, of Robin Toner. So now, please join me, everyone, in welcoming Amy Faulkner. Good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be here and to be introduced twice. So thank you. <laughs> it was a lovely introduction, so I do appreciate that. So we are immensely proud of Lakshmi at the Newhouse School. She is one of the most recognizable voices on NPR. But before that, she was a broadcast journalism major at Newhouse. And she interned at our university licensed public radio station, WAER. I think that means you did most of the work, right? Yeah, exactly. So Newhouse alums speak very fondly of their time at WAER and our student-run newspaper, The Daily Orange. Often, our alums are driven people and become leaders in their field. Like another of our well-known graduates, Robin Toner, who shaped political coverage for the New York Times for almost a quarter century. And there are still more great Newhouse journalists on the way. 
including we have at least seven current undergraduates and some graduate students here tonight that our toner program in political reporting brings down each year as part of this event. I am pretty sure most of them are at table seven, but Newhouse students in the room, please stand up so we know where you are. Thank you, students. So this is part of the student experience at the, the Newhouse School and Syracuse University, and we're very proud of our students. I also want to bring you warm greetings from Dean Lorraine Branham, who is out on medical leave at the moment. We are optimistic about her treatment and her recovery, and we look forward to her being back soon. I do want to talk about Lorraine and the 10 years ago when she worked to form this endowment with Peter and John Chapel and created the donor Robin Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. This event has always been one of Lorraine's favorites. And I can see why. I mean, significantly warmer weather when I got off the plane. That was a huge plus. But this chance in, in this room to discuss politics and coverage with award-winning journalists and to be inspired by great keynote speakers such as Governor Hogan, and really to be inspired by the best political journalism in our field. It is our hope at the Newhouse School that the Toner Prize and the light that it shines on political reporting acts like a beacon to nurture and guide our democracy. Now, more than ever, post Mueller report, this kind of reporting on politics is essential. We will award one winner tonight for the high quality political journalism, but I applaud all of you in this room who do this work. We sincerely thank you, and you can expect more intrepid Newhouse journalism graduates to follow your lead. There are many people and organizations to thank, but I promise to keep my list short. Thank you, Peter, for your guidance. I would like to thank Charlotte Grimes for her continued diligence, and Audrey Burian is around here somewhere in her expert organizational skills. The Newhouse School has been able to turn out great talent like Robin and Lakshmi because of the strong support it receives from the university, including the visionary leadership of Chancellor Kent Severud, who is here tonight with his wife, Dr. Ruth Chen. I feel very fortunate to work under the leadership team of the Chancellor and our Vice Chancellor and Provost, Michelle Wheatley, who I have the honor of introducing tonight. Provost Wheatley is an internationally recognized scholar and educator. She has contributed substantially to her field as a professor of biology, publishing over 100 papers. Provost Wheatley came to Syracuse in 2016 from West Virginia University, where she demonstrated as the provost there the kind of leadership that embraces change, empowers research excellence, and enhances the student experience. Previously, she worked as Dean of Science and Math and was Chair of Biology at Wright State University in Ohio. With a global education and a research portfolio that includes continuous National Science Foundation funding totaling $25 million over 30 years, Provost Wheatley has an impressive academic record. She earned a PhD from Birmingham University and completed her postdoctoral training at the University of Calgary in Canada. Born and raised in London, she became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 2003. Provost Sweetly is here tonight with two of her three children, daughters Veronica and Marguerite, who I've also been told are Reva and Maury. Is that right? I did that right. So I'm very happy about that. Please give them all a warm welcome, but especially to Syracuse University Vice Chancellor and Provost Michelle Wheatley. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Syracuse University, I welcome you all tonight for the presentation of the Toner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. Robin Toner was a great journalist with dual degrees from Syracuse University. As a graduate of our SI Newhouse School of Public Communications and Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, she saw how political reporting could serve the public good and be a powerful tool in strengthening communities. 
Robin was lost all too young, but her ideals remain alive in the Tona Prize and in the passion of our students in Newhouse who learn how to responsibly wield the power of the press. At Syracuse University, our vision is to prepare our students to become engaged citizens, scholars, and leaders in a rapidly changing global society. We're teaching them the value of open discourse and the increasing need for diligence to find and speak the truth. With Robin's well-known passion for meticulous research and accuracy in reporting, we can only imagine how disheartened she would be with our leaders vilifying political reporters. What would have been her take on the effect of Twitter and the lack of civility in today's political discourse? Certainly, she would have supported the efforts by keynote speaker to encourage our leaders to be less divisive. Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland has been vocal about the need for national unity and searching for ideas and solutions that can reach a wider audience. Larry Hogan was sworn in as the 62nd Governor of Maryland in 2015. He was overwhelmingly re-elected last November, receiving the most votes of any Maryland gubernatorial candidate and becoming the second Republican governor to be re-elected in the history of the state. Since taking office, office, Governor Hogan has been focused on Maryland's economy. The state has gained over 120,000 jobs and delivered $1.2 billion in tax, toll, and fee relief for families, retirees, and small business. In addition to tackling countless policy issues head on, Governor Hogan also faced a number of unexpected challenges with courage and candor. Just a few months into his first term, he was diagnosed with aggressive stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. On November the 16th, 2015, after undergoing 24-hour chemotherapy and multiple surgeries, he announced that he was 100% cancer-free and in complete remission. Since waging his own fight, the governor has made it his mission to raise awareness for those battling cancer and support efforts to find a cure. Governor Hogan's principled, common sense leadership has been recognized on the regional and national stage. He serves as vice chair of the National Governors Association, chairman of the regional Chesapeake Executive Council, and consistently has one of the highest job approval ratings in this country. Syracuse University, the SI Newhouse School of Public Communication, and the Toner Program take political discourse very seriously and praise Governor Larry Hogan's efforts. Syracuse University strives to be a place where all feel welcome to express their ideas, to interact in new ways, and to remove structural barriers to achieve full participation in our community. Governor Hogan, I promise that we will continue to do our part to prepare the next generation of journalists, citizens, and political leaders who will work alongside you to protect free press, free speech, and freedom of thought. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Governor Larry Hogan. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It is uh, such an honor to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, Provost Wheatley, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I want to send my heartfelt prayers to Dean Branham, and I'd like to thank Chancellor Siverud and Dean Faulkner and everyone at the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. I could never have imagined that Syrac Syracuse University would invite uh, an average political science student from Florida State University <laughs> to speak before such a distinguished group of the nation's journalists, uh, but I sincerely appreciate the opportunity. Um, I especially want to express my gratitude to all of the members of the Toner family who are with us. got the opportunity to meet all of them backstage. Uh, Jake and Nora, your sheer determination to honor your mom's memory 
and Peter, your commitment to memorialize your wife's incredible life. Are, uh, why we, it's the reason why we're all here tonight, and we thank you so much. I know all too well what a family goes through while dealing with a loved one's battle with cancer. And as long as I am governor of Maryland, and long after that, I will continue to proudly stand with all of those who are fighting against this terrible disease. I want to recognize not just tonight's award winners, but all of the political reporters, news executives, and each and every one of the print, broadcast, and online journalists who represent one of America's most important and all too often underappreciated professions. Since 2009, the Toner Prize has been awarded annually in recognition of the best national or local political reporting. This prestigious award is a lasting tribute to a woman whose life and career embodied the art and craft of journalism at its very best. Robin Toner appreciated the immense weight of the responsibility she bore as a journalist to keep the American people informed. During her nearly 25 years with the New York Times as the first woman to hold the position of national political correspondent, she covered five presidential campaigns and countless gubernatorial, congressional, and other races with grace and a meticulous eye for detail. Like all reporters, Robin knew the high standard to which she would be held by all those she covered and by those who followed her reporting. And she held herself to those same high standards. To this day, Robin Toner leaves a legacy of smart, fair, and objective journalism. A legacy that each and every one of you attempts to carry on. As a kid, I first learned the importance of the media and the value of good reporting from my father, who taught journalism classes at the University of Maryland, where he was known for his early morning lectures and for being really tough on all of those uh, future journalists. Uh, some of them did get the chance to pay him back, however, uh, during his later political career, including his three terms in Congress. Uh, but one of uh, the most pivotal moments of his career also happened to be one of the most significant moments in the history of American journalism. My father, served on the House Judiciary Committee during Watergate as the whole world was watching the impeachment proceedings. And despite tremendous political pressure, he put aside partisanship and he answered the demands of his conscience to do what he thought was the right thing for the nation that he loved. Party loyalty, he said, and personal affection and precedents of the past must fall before the arbiter of men's actions, the law itself. No man, not even the President of the United States, is above the law. And for our system of justice, for our system of government to survive, we must pledge our highest allegiance to the strength of the law and not to the common frailties of man. With those words, he became the first Republican to come out for the impeachment of President Richard Nixon.
Now that decision cost him dearly. He lost friends and supporters and his party's nomination for governor that year. But it earned him something more valuable, a quiet conscience and an honored place in history. I learned more about integrity in one day from him than most men learn in a lifetime. Those were uncertain times for our nation and certainly for members of the press. While other news organizations initially ignored the story, two young staffers, two young staff reporters at the Washington Post, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, did what great journalists do. They put in the work, they followed the story, and they were relentless in their pursuit of the truth, even when their report, the reporting was repeatedly denounced by the White House as being biased and misleading. It has been and always will be the responsibility of our press corps to hold elected officials accountable and to ensure that those serving in our highest offices uphold the public trust and represent the in interests of the people whom they were elected to serve. At the same time, members of the media also have an obligation to uncover the truth and to deliver fair and accurate reporting, to tell the story and not become the story. There has not been a single day, good or bad, when I have not been grateful for the honor and the privilege of serving the people of Maryland as governor. During the past four years, I have enjoyed a very open, sometimes spirited, uh, but always collegial rapport with the members of Maryland's press corps, even when they occasionally get it wrong. <laughs> like when the Baltimore Sun endorsed my opponent in 2014. <laughs> Fortunately, they made the correction and got it right last year. <laughs> but I know that this is a difficult and challenging time for your profession. Faith and confidence in the media is nearly as low as it is for elected officials. Welcome to the club. <laughs> I've never been shy about speaking up when I thought that coverage was unfair or inaccurate. But I have always had the greatest respect for the journalists who bring honor to their profession and who day in and day out work hard to shine a light on the world around us so that we can all see with more clarity and with greater understanding. Our First Amendment and our democracy itself depends on a strong, vibrant, and unfettered free press. And we must all continue to work hard to defend that at all costs. You may not always get it right, but you are not fake news. You are not the enemy of the people. And it is that kind of dangerous rhetoric that threatens to undermine and erode the trust between the people and the very institutions that are the cornerstone of our democracy. On June 28th of last year, we lost five journalists in a heinous, unthinkable act of violence against my hometown newspaper, the Capital Gazette in Annapolis. I was in a meeting in my office in the State House when state troopers interrupted me to give me the horrific report in real time. 
I immediately rushed to the scene, which was just a few blocks away. I will never forget the heartbreak and the utter devastation written on the faces of so many that day. There is no amount of clarity that can ever explain or nullify the pain that comes with losing so many lives for so little reason. The lives and the legacies of Gerald Fishman, Robert Hyacin, John McNamara, Rebecca Smith, and Wendy Winters will not ever be forgotten. We continue to mourn with their families, and we will continue to honor their memories. But failing to take actions to ensure that a tragedy like the shooting at the Capitol Gazette never happens again does a disservice to all those, all that those five journalists stood for. In the wake of hatred and senseless violence, we must come together to seek common sense solutions. Last year, I was proud to work in a bipartisan effort with the Maryland legislature to enact landmark red flag legislation to try and prevent another tragedy like this from ever happening again. <laughs> Under this law, courts can order the removal of firearms from individuals who are suspected of being a danger to themselves or to others. At the state level, we are doing everything in our power to protect the lives and the safety of our citizens. But no single policy, reform, or piece of legislation is good enough. We must also all stand and affirm together that there is no place in our society for that kind of hatred and violence. And each one of us has a role to play in that. I believe that you should be able to have confidence in the character and civility of the people you elect to office, regardless of their party affiliation. Those of us blessed by your trust should give you a government that appreciates that no one of us has all the answers or all the power. A government that tolerates contrary views among a diverse citizenry without making them into enemies or doubting their patriotism. A government that can discuss and debate with as much civility as passion, and with a view to persuade, not intimidate, to encourage, not demonize or defeat. Most Americans are completely fed up with the debilitating politics here in Washington, where insults substitute for debate, recrimination for negotiation, and gridlock for compromise. But I still believe that what unites us is greater than that which divides us. And to those who say that our political system is too broken and can't be fixed, I would argue that in Maryland, we have already shown a better path forward. We have debated, discussed, and reasoned together, honestly and productively, with integrity and sincere purpose. We've argued but without acrimony. We've negotiated without hidden agendas and compromised, without political posturing. We didn't demand Republican solutions or Democratic solutions. We sought out bipartisan common sense solutions that worked for the people of our state. And we are proud to be sending, setting an example for the rest of America. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest crisis facing our nation 
isn't a wall between Mexico and the United States. It's the wall that has divided us right here in this country. Our nation would be so much better off without all of the bitter, angry, and divisive politics. And if we could get back to just all being Americans once again. For our elected officials, that means putting the people's priorities ahead of partisan interests. For members of the media, that means being a bit more like Robin Toner and never losing sight of how your work affects people's everyday lives. Now more than ever, it means not being beholden to headlines or ratings, but instead just practicing the traditional tenets of good journalism, of following a lead, gathering the facts, and shedding light on the truth. As I think back to that tragic day last June in Annapolis, the Capitol Gazette office was a horrific crime scene. But just outside, amid all the chaos, there were Capitol reporters with their laptops open. They were covering the story, the massacre of their colleagues. Late that night, the paper issued a one-sentence tweet. It said, yes, we're putting out a damn paper tomorrow. <laughs> and of course they did, and a damn good one too. In the midst of such an unspeakable tragedy and such an overwhelming heartbreak after seeing people they loved brutally attacked for simply doing their jobs. The journalists of the Capital Gazette newspaper never faltered. They did not shrink from fear. They did not give in or give up. They got right back up. They stood firm, they pressed on, and they came back stronger than ever. I believe that Robin Toner would have been immensely proud of that. Thank you for the incredibly vital work that you all do. And thank you for choosing to be a part of this noble profession. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Hogan. A lot of headlines right there. <laughs> some people tweeting, some people emailing. Thank you. So we now move to another very exciting moment of the evening. And of course, that's the awards. So. Here we go, Peter, are we ready or shall I? Okay, the Toner Prize. The Toner Prize is nearly 10 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> Feels like she started yesterday. So in that time, this award, this amazing award, has become one of the highest honors in US political journalism. One big reason for that is Robin's home paper, the New York Times, 
whose editors and reporters help launch the TONA program and annually host a contingent of Syracuse journalism students and whose publishing family, the Salzburgers, have provided general financial support. The program and prize are not alone in growing over the past decade. So have Robin's children, Nora and Jake. They were in, I can't believe this, they were in the sixth grade when this program started. And I'm not kidding here, in a couple months, they'll graduate from college. Which, I know, I know. <laughs> which, as Peter shared with me, was and is a dream come true for Robin. So here to present the toner honorable mentions is Nora Gosling. Good evening. This is Jake and my ninth year of doing this event. Many of you have watched us through high school, middle school, college, and now almost to our graduation. Maybe you were there the first time when we were both 12, weren't quite sure how to dress up for an event, and had no experience with public speaking. Now we're almost 22, preparing for our graduations, and who knows what comes next. This event has always been a sort of time capsule for Jake and I. It always brings up a lot of questions, what telling the truth looks like in our society, what voices are heard and represented, what it means to continue someone's legacy uh, as we become adults. I thought that now, after nine years of this event, answers might become a little clearer. That hasn't been the case. If anything, those questions about telling the truth, about making sure people are heard, about living with someone's absence, have only become murkier as Jake and I set out into the world. I take heart, though, in coming back to this event, to you all, and seeing what excellence really looks like and what it takes. This year, our judges selected not one, but two honorable mentions, both of which they felt set the bar unbelievably high for rigorous and dedicated journalism. The first honorable mention goes to Isaac Arnsdorf from ProPublica. Arnsdorf zeroed in on the Veterans Administration, the second largest agency in the federal government, one that affects the lives of millions of Americans but receives little coverage by the national press. Cultivating sources at a time when the VA was threatened with job cuts and even basic facts were difficult to come by, Arnsdorf did the meticulous work of exposing a secret agenda within the VA. He gained a deep understanding of the convoluted administration systems and empowered veterans with this information. Dozens of veterans called and emailed ProPublica in response. One email from Army veteran Dale Prickett read, you may have truly saved lives, leading to improved care at the VA based on your work. The second honorable mention goes to Glenn Kessler, Salvador Rizzo, and Meg Kelly of the Washington Post fact checker team. President Trump acknowledged in October that he's only been telling the truth when he can. Kessler, Rizzo, and Kelly responded to this challenge by tackling every single uh, suspect statement made by Trump, compiling the information into an exhaustive, easily accessible database. They tracked a total of 5,600 false or misleading claims, more than 15 a day. As Roger Cohen of the New York Times described it, the database will become a reference, a talisman for years to come. I'd like to invite all four honorable mentions up to the stage now to receive the recognition that they so deserve. Uh, so I just want to thank 
the judges, the officers of Syracuse University, uh, of course, Robin's family, and an unexpected thank you to someone who is at my table um, and who probably doesn't even remember, but she helped me get my very first job in journalism. That's Lucy Dalglish. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a huge honor to be in the company of Glenn and Sal and Meg and Jason and uh, to accept an award named for someone uh, so esteemed for her courage, tenacity, and generosity. It's also an honor to be a member of our profession at this time. Despite the concerted campaign to vilify journalists and undermine trust in what we do, there is an outpouring of support for independent investigative reporting. I saw it in the dozens of messages I received from veterans around the country proving not only that it's still possible for journalists to make a difference, but that sometimes only we can, and we must. Thank you, Nora, and thank you to Syracuse University uh, Newhouse School for this honor. Unlike many in this room, I did not cross paths much with Robin, except as a reader who greatly admired her work. In the decade before her passing, I covered diplomacy, where I tried hard to get information out of her brother, Mark, at the State Department. <laughs> and when I arrived in Washington 25 years ago, I covered economics and certainly got to know Peter on that beat. Without a doubt, Robin's byline was one of the gold standards in journalism. She always managed to keep her articles grounded in policy, a difficult task when it's much easier for politics reporters to highlight conflict and skate past the issues. At the Fact Checker, we try to live up to Robin's example. We evaluate the accuracy of political statements, but at heart, it's an effort to unravel and explain complex policy issues to readers. The goal is, if you are a regular reader of our 300 or so fact checks a year and view our videos, you will have a better understanding of the policy choices being debated in Washington. Now, President Trump posed a unique challenge because, frankly, he doesn't seem to care much about policy nuances. We created our database of his false and misleading statements largely because too many of his statements could be fact-checked in a few sentences. That way, we could keep the regular column focused on policy. Little did we know it would become such an all-consuming task. When Trump soon hits 10,000 claims in about a month or so, I estimate it will have required 2,500 hours of work. On average, each entry requires about 15 minutes to identify, categorize, and write. So to put it another way, that's more than 108 hour days for each of us standing here, many weekends and late nights, on top of our regular day jobs. Now, Michelle Lee, our, my at, on the fact checker at the time, originally suggested the idea of the database for the first 100 days. When she moved on to another job at the Post, Trump was only at 1,300 claims. So thanks, Michelle. <laughs> now, the Washington Post gives us enormous independence to choose the topics we write about and determine how many Pinocchios to award to politicians. I'm grateful for the trust they have shown in our judgment. But our editors have also been a source of ideas in the past year, which is reflected in the package that made up our entry. Executive Marty Barron and I had a morning conversation in which he suggested it was time to say that we should document, that we could document, that Trump had knowingly told a lie. National editor Steven Ginsburg suggested we create a new category for repeated falsehoods by politicians, the bottom of Pinocchio. He, he, uh, so far, only one politician has earned that. Uh, he has also suggested we catalog every factual statement made by a president in, the camp in a campaign rally as either true or false. And that article was written by Sal and Meg as I tried to offer feedback via funky Wi-Fi connection while on vacation in Tahiti. <laughs> now, since this is a team entry, we will thank family and colleagues in person. I would like to close with thanks to our readers. We have the best readers in journalism. Many of our fact checks come from reader suggestions. Our readers provide a constant stream of feedback, advice, and criticism that keeps us on our toes and encourages us to do better as we strive to meet the standards set by Robin. Thank you.
Now we're going to hear from my brother, Jacob Gosselin, who will be awarding the Toner Prize this year. The winner of this year's Toner Prize is, in the words of one of our judges, a master storyteller. His stories span subject matter but share key features, a complex cast of characters, a level of detail that envelops the reader, and a plot that makes them impossible to put down. Of his great submissions, two stood out. The first is a profile for the New York Times Magazine on Devin Nunes, the 44-year-old congressman whose tenure as chair of the House Intelligence Committee turned the institution upside down. Like any good profile, the piece begins long before Nunes ever made headlines and tracks how his life molded him into the man of the moment in 2017. In telling the story of Nunes, our winner also tells the story of a Congress increasingly consumed by paranoia, division, and distrust. The second is an in-depth look at how the Trump administration has reshaped the courts. Again, this story begins before Trump with the Federalist Society, a powerful legal group of conservative jurists that spanned decades. It follows their unlikely alliance with the Trump administration, an alliance that has, in the word of one Federalist Society member, made our wildest dreams come true. What sets these stories apart isn't just their author's masterful writing and reporting. It's their content. As our winner remarked in his entry, it's almost impossible to write pieces about politics in 2018 without writing about President Trump. But these pieces aren't focused on the man or on the constant chaos of his White House. They're focused on the fallout from it the trickle-down effect his, pres his presidency has had on institutions that are at the foundation of our republic. These effects will linger long after the president's term is served, and that makes these stories all the more important to tell. It is an honor to present this year's Toner Prize to Jason Zengerly. Thank you. Thank you to Jake, Nora, and Peter for creating the Toner Prize and Syracuse for administering it. And thank you to Charlotte Grimes and her fellow judges for awarding it to me uh, this year. It's uh, just a thrill and an honor to receive it. Um, there are a few other people I'd like to thank tonight. To all the editors and the copy editors and the fact checkers, especially the fact checkers at uh, New York Times Magazine and GQ, thank you for making my work so much better. I want to particularly thank my story editors who are both here tonight, um, Jeff Gannon from GQ and Charlie Homans at the Times Magazine. A great editor is more than just an editor. He's a collaborator, he's a shrink. Um, oftentimes, depending on the state of my first draft, he's a co-writer. Uh, Jeff and Charlie are all of those things, and I feel like this award is as much theirs as it is mine, so thanks. I've been fortunate to have a number of uh, wonderful editors over the years, first at the New Republic and then at uh, New York Magazine and GQ. They're people who've taught me so much about what it means to be a good journalist, and I wanted to thank them in a public way while I have the opportunity. So to Chris Orr, Kate Marsh, Richard Just, David Haskell, Devin Gordon, Rachel Morris, and Greg Vies, thank you. My best editor, though, has always been my wife, Claire. Um, if she hadn't gone into medicine, she would have been a phenomenal copy editor. It's absolutely humbling how many typos and grammatical mistakes she can spot in my work. Um, but more than the copy editing, she has been a sounding board and an advisor and someone who's endlessly supportive of my work, and I can't thank her enough. Our two kids, Asa and Georgia, um, are here tonight. They're spending the first day of their spring break from school with their dad at work. <laughs> a year ago at this time, they were at Disney World. <laughs> um, as, as bad luck would have it, I was actually closing two of the stories that are being honored tonight while we were at Disney World, which meant that while they and Claire were riding the Seven Dwarves mine train, I was often back in the, I was often back in the hotel on the phone with Charlie and Jeff. Um, so I really just want to thank Asa and Georgia for being incredibly patient, 
and I promise them that next spring break I will try not to work. And lastly, I want to thank my parents, uh, Joe and Linda, who are also here. Uh, they have, there are a lot of things I should thank them for, but tonight I want to thank them for subscribing to two newspapers when I was a kid. <laughs> I started flipping through the Washington Post sports section before I could even read, and it was the first thing I'd reach for every morning before breakfast throughout my childhood. But then when I was about 13 years old, I put the sports page aside and I started reading the New York Times front section first. I was fascinated by the 1988 presidential campaign, and I was especially fascinated by Michael Dukakis. <laughs> Among American junior high school students, I had to be one of, and if I'm being honest, probably the only Mike Dukakis superfan. <laughs> my interest in Dukakis was admittedly a bit strange, but in my defense, I think it was understandable when you realize who was covering the Dukakis campaign for the Times, and that was Robin Toner. She had a gift for making even a politician like Dukakis a fascinating figure. <laughs> I never met Robin, um, but after being introduced to her work in 1988, I always looked for her byline, both before and after I became a journalist. And her work has long stood as a model of what political reporting can and should be. She wrote not just about politics, but about policy and about their intersection. And she understood both the importance and the stakes of what she was covering and she had the talent and the tenacity to make her readers understand them too. And just as an aside, as someone who's spent his adult life now in North Carolina, or the majority of his adult life in North Carolina, I especially appreciate the expertise she had in Southern politics. When I moved to Chapel Hill almost two decades ago and undertook a crash course on the politics of my new home, a colleague suggested I read three things. W.J. Cash's The Mind of the South, V.O. Key's Southern Politics in State and Nation, and every Robin Toner clip with a Southern Dateline that I could find on Nexus. <laughs> in some ways, the challenges Robin faced more than 30 years ago in writing about Mike Dukakis are the opposite of the challenges political reporters face today. No one ever accused, ever accused Donald Trump of being boring. The public's appetite for news about the president's personal foibles and palace intrigue at the White House has been a boon to the cable news networks and national newspapers and magazines. While the journalism industry is in crisis across the country, the Associated Press recently reported that more than 1,400 towns and cities in the US have lost a newspaper over the past 15 years, and state capital press rooms have become ghost towns. Here in Washington, the political reporting business is booming. It would, of course, be nice to spread around some of those journalistic resources, but on the whole, the public's interest in Washington and the Trump administration is a good thing. And I am in awe of, and I'm often daunted by the remarkable work that so many political reporters are doing right now in covering this administration. And yet, I do worry that we sometimes get so caught up in the daily soap opera of American politics, whether it's what's going on in the White House or now, what's beginning to happen on the campaign trail, that we can lose sight of the profound and far-reaching consequences of this dramatic political moment. The work that's being honored here tonight, whether it's Isaacs reporting on the unlikely intersection of the Mar-a-Lago crowd and the VA healthcare system, or the Post's indefatigable fact checker team, or even some of my stories on the implosion of the House Intelligence Committee or the Trump administration's remaking of the federal courts, I think are good examples of political reporting that both acknowledges some of the entertaining absurdities of this particular political moment, while at the same time focuses on the downstream effects of the Trump presidency that will be with us long after this moment passes. This is an exciting time to be a political reporter, and it's an important time too. And if we're being honest, it's a scary time with so many un unanswered questions about the future of our profession to say nothing of the things like that happened in Annapolis. I'm grateful for the opportunity to do this work, and I'm grateful for a night like tonight when some of this work is recognized. And I'd imagine I speak for all the other reporters in this room when I say that I'm looking forward to getting back to work tomorrow. Thank you. As we wrap up, a few more thanks are in order. Uh, first, thank you to Charlotte, Luke, and Audrey for all they do to make this night possible.
for keeping my dad sane. And Walton Family Advisor Kiki McLean, who have been quiet but critical supporters. Thank you to Precision Strategies and its co-founder, Stephanie Cutter, who understand mom's legacy and have supported it. Thank you to Jenny LeCompte and the Glover Park Group, Bill McInturf and Public Opinion Strategies, Jill Zuckman and SKD Knickerbocker, Drew Altman and the Kaiser Family Foundation, who have all been important supporters. Again, thank you to John Chappell, for all he does to make these nights possible. And thank you to the governor for his political bravery and his kindness in coming here tonight. And thank you to my extended family, especially my mom's siblings here, Jane, Pat, Gretchen, and Mark Toner, and her dear friend, Jack Farrell. Finally, thanks to all of you for coming out to honor these great reporters and the institutions that support them and the fact-based journalism mom loves so much. I can't wait to see you all here next year for the 10th year anniversary.